Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Rams Review Podcast. It's Corey along with you today. But I've got a favorite of uh, a Derby County favorite, a favorite player of mine, hopefully a favorite player of yours. Um, it's none other than Johnny Russell. Johnny, Sporting Kansas City captain, Derby County winger, Johnny Russell. Johnny, how the heck are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. Thank you. How are you? Oh, I'm living I'm living the dream. You know, it's it's uh, what, 30 degrees in, in mid-February, Valentine's Day. So what better time to spend Valentine's Day with one of the players that I absolutely love? Uh, I appreciate you appreciate you taking the time. I know you're in Miami now on Sporting Kansas City preseason. Do you? I'm jealous because I think you have slightly better weather than my like 42 degrees. Yeah, um, just so I uh, appreciate you taking the time from the grind to, to to reminisce down memory lane and to talk a little bit about the future with with Sporting Kansas City as well. Johnny, I, I wanted to start with coming to Derby. I know obviously you had a successful time at, at Dundee, and I know preparing for this that you, I think you really kind of took to Derby and, and, and really when a club of that magnitude kind of came in, it was a natural kind of progression for you to go there in your career. Um, talk to me a little bit about, because I think once you signed for Derby, there was a very significant change in the dugout, uh, maybe just a few months after you joined. Talk mm -hmm. to me about your impressions of Nigel Clough, because some of the other former players I've talked to have worked with him. He seems a bit of a Marmite character, right? He either liked you or he didn't like you. And it was kind of one or the other. Talk to me a little bit about Nigel, the process of coming to Derby, what it was like playing for him, and then the transition very quickly to Steve because you thought you were going to play for a Nigel Clough Derby County, and then all of a sudden Steve McLaren comes in and it completely changed. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I didn't know there was any interest from, from Derby. Um, I had it in my head that I wanted to go abroad. I wanted to sort of break the mold of Scottish players who had done well and went to England. I wanted to go and try something different. So all the interest kind of that I knew about was from teams abroad, um, like teams France, Spain, um, you know, Italy. So there was never really any sort of interest or noise I heard coming from, from obviously down south. And then I was actually in Tenerife um, at the end of the season on holiday. Uh, and that's when it sort of actually happened really fast. Um, Derby sort of came out of nowhere. It was Derby and and, and Celtic uh, made uh, matching bids. Both got rejected because United wanted more. Um, and Derby raised the money. Celtic wouldn't match it. So it, it only really came down to it was only Derby in the race. <clears throat> and then I mean, obviously, everyone knows about the size of club that Derby is. Um, you know, I'm a huge football fan, so I know, you know, I know a lot about them. And then I, I spoke to, I spoke to Nigel Clough, and pretty much made my mind up in that phone call that I wanted to play for him. And then, obviously, didn't tell him that on the phone, but he was like, like, come and fly over, um, come and see the place, like we'll have a chat. Um, and that was that really once I once I landed there um, actually Bryso um, was a wee bit of a tour guide he took me around a few spots um, he was sort of he was the one that was like pushing it as well oh this is like where the boys live stuff like that I was like I haven't signed yet mate so <laughs> relax for that um, but then went and spoke to Nigel and I was like Aye, this is this is what I want to what I do I want to play for him Um and unfortunately, I only got to play for him for, I think it was 10 games. Um, I think it was after the Forest defeat. And then we actually, me and a couple of the boys went to grab something to eat. And we got a, we got a message from somebody that worked at the, the club saying that he, he had been let go. So that's tough as well. Um, going back to your, your earlier one about, you know, Marmite, he... You know, he loved me and you know, I I, I love the guy as well. Um such a such a good guy, such a good man manager as well. Um so that was that was a tough one, especially making the decision to go to a different team and then your manager that brings you there gets fired so quick. You know, like, oh this this could go wrong. And obviously at that time I was still playing as a centre forward. And then obviously 
Steve McLaren came in. And then it was only then that I transitioned to, you know, play as a winger. So it was all relatively new to me. Um, we played 4-4-2 under Nigel, me and big Chris Martin. Kind of the same way I'd, I'd been used to at Dundee United, I played with John Daly. So I was always, I always played around the target man and kind of give a bit of freedom to, you know, make runs in behind or you know, go and find spaces to exploit. And then I had to... I had to learn on the job and I had to learn very quickly because I knew if I didn't adapt in the new system that we were going to play, if I, were, I wasn't going to be the target man. And I knew if I didn't adapt, if I didn't change my game, then you know my, my time there was going to be very short. So I'm not one for, for quitting or, or throwing the towel in. So I got the head down, learned you know, on the job. And I mean, I think most people would agree and sort of recent memory that's that's the best football they've probably seen and it's the best football that I've probably like played as a whole. So they were enjoyable times. Obviously the end of the season didn't didn't finish the way I feel we deserved. Um but I mean it, it is what it is. But just for the like the product of actual like playing football the right way, I think that was that was close to Perfect for me. I think, Johnny, a lot could be said that, that that team that you were in maybe was the beginning of setting Derby up for what they eventually came to a couple of years ago because of the expectations that were raised, you know, once Nigel had come in and Steve came in and then you saw that the, the club was on such an upward trajectory for three or four years. And I'm not saying that you played a part in it because obviously you didn't. You were just a, a part in a machine that played very good football, but that I think yeah. raised the expectations of the football club and then Lent, obviously, I'm sure you're aware as a football fan, down the road of what Derby accumulated in a couple of years ago. Yeah. What What did Steve say to you day one when he walked in? Because I've always wondered that, like, you obviously signed on to play for Nigel. You would run through a brick wall for him. You signed for this club. Your family's still gone to getting adjusted. And then, like, boom, he's got to come in. What does the new manager say to you day one? Like, hey, guys, sorry. Like, I know the new guy's gone, but I'm here now. What kind of the talk was that? Do you remember that? No, it wasn't really anything like that. He just came in. He was very, very positive, saying how grateful and excited he was for the opportunity and knew a lot about us um, and said that we were, obviously we were going to work on it, change the way we played. The first time we actually met him was, it was a game, I'm sure it was a game after Nigel got fired and we played... I'm sure it was Ipswich. Yeah, I think it was Ipswich, right? That 4-4 game, right? And he came in at halftime, I think. They were smacking us in that game. And uh, they came in at half time, And uh, I saw Mo come in and ranting and raving, having a pop. Uh, and then he kind of did a little bit as well, but then calmed it down, made a couple of changes and like spoke a little bit. And then obviously we go out and end up drawing the game. But it was, uh, uh, it was just a very quick transition. I mean, it has to be in a championship. There's just so many games. It's, like, the fixture list is so condensed. You just have to, you, have, you just have to get on with it. You have to power through. And you know, we were a team put together. And I think Nigel doesn't get enough credit for that. It was just guys with a second chance or guys that had something to prove. Um, just hungry like group of guys that he put together and you know that was that was his team you know what I mean that obviously Steve came in and, and took over and obviously got his playing I mean incredible stuff but the team was put together by by Nigel so I don't th I don't feel he gets the sort of credit that, that he deserves for for putting that side together yeah, because he, I think Steve only came out. I think he signed uh, what Dawkins. He signed Docks, and then he signed brought Wisdom in, and mm -hmm. then like later in the season, I think he brought Bamford in on loan. But like after yeah. that, I don't think there were very many changes that he made no. to the team. That that core was there. And Johnny, there's a couple of games I want to talk about in that season, and I think you know which both of these games are where we're going to go down this path because it's interesting because you mentioned the Forest defeat and how it kind of you know it cost basically Nigel his job. Talk to me about deforestation day. 
Because I remember watching that, and I remember you hit a left-footed, like, half volley from 35 yards, upper 90 against, I think it was Carl Darlow in goal. Mm -hmm. 5-0, biggest defeat for Forrest in that that fixture in the history. And that was kind of like a, a, you know, a separate thing because it was a measuring stick of where you had been with under Nigel and then kind of where you were trending upward with Steve McLaren. Talk to me about your memories of that day, your memories of that strike, and just overall being involved in, in that result. To be honest, I started that day very angry because I didn't start the game. <laughs> but And then I'm sure, uh, obviously, once the game starts, you're, you're in it for the boys. You know what I mean? You you're, you want them to do well. You're behind them. And then, obviously, we get, we get the early goals. And I'm sure it was Wardy that got injured. I think Wardy done his hammy. And I, I came in for him. And I, they'd been, I was in a bit of a goal scoring rut at that point. I hadn't scored for a while. Um, and they were constantly telling me, like, because we'd, we'd do stuff in training. I'd hit shots all the time in training. I would do that in training. They're like, why? Like, just, why don't you just unleash in a game? Just hit, just hit shots. And then obviously that one, just, we were keeping the ball for so long. You could feel it. They were, they were done. And then, Turn like take a turn. My obviously my my initial thought is slip like someone in, look for a pass, and they just backed off, backed off, and it opened up. And I was like, you know what? I'm just I'm banging this, and uh, I caught it so clean. Um, and then and I was, I still get messages to this day about like people's like favorite goal or best goal they've seen. So it was a uh, it was a nice one to play a part in what was. Bryce's day and uh, the fans' day as well. So it was to see him get the hat trick as well, make history and that. Then just such a good, such a good day, such a good atmosphere, experience, and good night followed it as well. Um, <laughs> we celebrated that one a wee bit. So it was um, place was place was buzzing. Don't think Kenny has bought a drink all night. Talk me through, talk me through Wembley because that's I'm, I'm assuming that's a differing set of emotions completely opposite Mm. right and I remember that is the first and only time I have ever cried after a football match and it put me off football for a while and the Champions League final was later that evening and I couldn't watch it because I was just I was like I am done with football I'm never watching it again I've had enough but you were in on goal I remember I think it was around maybe the hour mark or something like that and it was like oh Johnny Russell's going to score here we're going up and Gary O'Neill came from nowhere and just scythed you down and then obviously we know what happened later in that game what are your I can assume what the camp, the mood in the camp was in that dressing room. Do you know anything that was said afterward in that dressing room? And how did you feel knowing that kind of a glass door sliding glass moment if Gary O'Neill hadn't made that, you know, hadn't made that tackle, you know, careers and careers and lives might have been completely different. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've relived that so many times. Um, I, I'm confident myself if I could pick a perfect scenario in and goal. That's it. Coming in from the right hand side, got that whole sort of backside of the goal open. That's if I could pick an ideal finish. That's it, and you can feel it in that moment. Like you know, you're in, and like you said, could be could be life changing. And then he does what probably anyone does in that situation. You just take one for your team. Um, I mean, they were hanging on in that game as well. We we dominated that game start to finish just complete control in that game and even like after it some of their boys were like we were just hanging on for penalties basically to try and get a chance like they were they had nothing going forward they just looked like they couldn't do anything we were all over them and then that happens and at that point like Steve McClellan always made changes around the hour mark and I was usually one of them. But I came out in the second half and sort of 10, 15 minutes leading up to that, I was everywhere. I, you can just feel it. You're getting into a game. Like you just feel like you're sort of tide turning. And then that happened. And I don't think it was long after that he took me off. And s- still to this day, I'll always respect decisions, but I feel like that one was a mistake. Um, uh, that one... 
that one still hurts. And then obviously the goal, just you just realise in that, that minute that everything that you've worked all year for is just gone in an instant. There's no redo, there's no way to get it back. I think Season's it was the closest over. thing you can get to a golden goal because it was like, I, was, and I remember I think he made like three changes right after and he tried to bring like Patrick, he made like some attackers and it was like, Steve, it's just gone at this point. Like yeah. it was like 94, seven, you know, 94, 45. Yeah. And it was like, it was just gone. And, and it was, was there, did you feel like there was a hangover in the camp the following season or was it, you know, you went away, you, you know, reflected on the situation and you came straight back in and thought, we're just going to do the exact same thing again. Cause I know it's difficult. You have to go to the same places again, home and away. Yeah. On Tuesday nights and everything. Did you feel like there was a hangover? Or did you guys feel in the camp that like, we've got a good team. We will do this again. Kind of that. Um, we don't have a, we don't have a long break after that. Um, and we were, we were right back into it. So it was still kind of like a hangover of that when we, we first came back in, but. Like very quickly, you have to be like, right, it's it's gone. You have to you have to just get on with. It. There's nothing you can do to change it. Yes, you can learn from mistakes that were made, but we felt that the playoff season, we felt if we were given more time, like the way we were playing, um, then we there was a chance we would have went up automatically. So that was a mindset going into the next year that. Like how close we came, we fell short a couple of games to go. I think the, I think we went and played Burnley away, and that one sort of killed it. Um, but we we felt we were right there, so we we're like this same group of guys. There'll be additions, but it's us to go after it again. And then obviously just just didn't happen that year either. Um, and it's just such a hard league to get out of. Um, when you get that chance and you don't take it, it's it's difficult to get them again, as you I mean, you seen. I didn't get another playoff final the whole time I was there, so it was um, it was difficult. Do you? I think the next few seasons, probably looking back at it now, seemed kind of frustrating because Derby were always the bridesmaid, never the bride. You know, always that nearly man, like always in the playoffs, always having a good, always having a great team, but never being able to win that one or two games that would push them into promotion. Mm-hmm. Do you talk to me a little bit about the frustration there? And then, you know, what ultimately felt like you needed to change from Derby to, to come to Kansas city? Was it, was it part of that frustration of like, I'm just not that I'm fed up of it, but am I fed, I'm just fed up of like always being part of a nearly team or, and things just kind of got stale. What kind of, what were your kind of emotions around that? Um, no, it wasn't anything to do with like coming close and, and falling short. That's, you know, I, I would never, I would never quit on that. Um, it was just a lot of things had happened. Um, sort of in my last, I'd say year, probably year to eighteen months before I left, there was just a lot of things that went on behind the scenes. Um, there was some things that were directed directed at me and I found out a few things that the club were doing behind my back uh, that I just felt uh, betrayed is a strong word but I was just disappointed in the way I was treated or wasn't given the respect I felt that I deserved um, in certain situations, um, and there was, I'm not, I'm not going to go into it. I've, I've never went in here, and I'm not going to talk bad about the club. You know, what I mean, I'm, I'm old enough now. I've moved on from it. Um, but there was, there was some things that went on behind the scenes, and some things done that if I actually told them. Then there was there would be some people there who would not would not look the greatest to be honest. Um, none of the people are at the club anymore, so I'm not going to drag it back up yeah. and speak about people. But there was just 
after that, so I just lost something. Um, there it affected my game massively, which is my fault. That's I'm not blaming someone else. Like I can control that, um, and I didn't. Uh, I let it seep into my game. Just completely lost the love playing the game. Just, just was not enjoying it. Just, just didn't want to be there most days, to be honest. And I think most people could see that in my performances that I had lost something. I'd lost like the spark that most people would associate with me. And I felt I just needed. I I didn't see a way back. I just thought I have to I have to change this. Like it's. The situation isn't going to change it. I have to change it. So that was why I sort of knew in my head um, that that was going to be... I was out of contract. The club were trying to offer me a new contract. Uh, and I just kind of knew that uh, that was going to be my last year. Um, and then, obviously, it, I was more than willing to be there to the summer. Um, but the decision was made that, you know, just in the January... Early February, it was it was probably time to just do it then, um, and made the jump over here. Um, and haven't really looked back since. Yeah, and I can understand why, because Overland Park is actually a pretty nice place, and you've got a nice stadium in in um, there and everything like that. And I know Kansas is going to be a World Cup venue in 2026, not at Child Mercy Park, but at Arrowhead Stadium. Arrowhead, yeah. Um, what surprised you about MLS? Because I think a lot of people sit there and go. Johnny Russell's just gone to MLS. His career is dead. He's going to a retirement league. I know you ended up playing for Scotland while representing Sporting Kansas City. Yeah. What What surprised you about MLS? Did you think when you were going that the, the standard would be as good as what it was? What What surprised you, if anything? I didn't think the standard would, would have been as high. Um, I was a big fan of the league. I watched the league, so I knew the standard was good. Um and I know what people's perception of the MLS is. I'm not going to change that. Um, I don't think it will ever. The European perception of that is like a retirement league. Um, I think it's very naive to think that now when you look at the league, how it's grown, the players that they're bringing in. Yes, there's, they still bring in a superstar towards the end of their career. But if you look at the signings that teams are making, they're all young, up-and-coming, exciting players. And it's become more of a you know, a destination that these guys want to come to as well because they see that they can come here, play in a, in a good league and then move on. Um, so, no, it's, the standard is, is something that really surprised me. And then every year I've been here as well, it just continues to grow. The league grows, the standard of player grows, the, you know, the competition grows, it's just... Constantly, constantly adapting. There's so many different things to take into considera uh, consideration as well. That you know, I don't think like the travel, different climates. You know what I mean? Just loads of stuff that you just you just don't think about until you're in it. But I'm I've always something that's someone that's sort of threw myself in, and you just try and adapt, you know, to the the culture or the place around you. Um, I think that's why. I've been lucky in my career. You know, the fans have always been great with me because I think they, they can relate to that. They just see someone that's just loves the game and gives everything they've got um, every time they're out there. So it's, it's definitely the, the thing that surprised me the most was, was the standard and, and how high it actually was. Yeah, and from someone, Johnny, who's been involved, uh, been watching MLS since its inception, like, I think you're dead on there. I think the, the idea of a retirement league, yeah, you get Lionel Messi and his buddies from Barcelona circa 2004 showing up and what happens. But I think those, you know, there are players that go over in their prime like you did, you know, several years ago. You know, Matt Crooks has just gone from Middlesbrough, former Derby County goalkeeper Henrik Ravas is at New England Revolution. And they are bringing in players to make the league, uh, you know, a lot more competitive. And it's easy to sit there and look at the star names like Lionel Messi and Busquets and all the, you know, and even he ever Ibrahimovic and stuff like that and go, oh, well, look, they're all, yeah, but they're also world round, you know, world superstars. But I think, you know, that, that next year down the very good, the very good to very great player class yeah. is getting, you know, that standard is exceptionally high. And I want to be very respectful of your time, Johnny. So I've got just one more question for you. 
you know, I know a couple of seasons ago, Kansas City almost made it to the MLS Cup final. Um, last season was, I think, a little disappointing from, you know, the previous season. I don't think you guys were kind of at the level that I think a lot of people preseason expected you guys to be. Um, you're in preseason now, and I know it's very early days, and you've got a long, hot summer uh, ahead of you. You know, uh, as the captain of sport in Kansas City, are you guys confident going into the season? How do you think the season's going to go uh, from your perspective, and how's the training camp going so far? Everything's been going good. Um, I think I think we look good. I mean, you never know, judging off preseason until the season starts. We looked good last year, and then we go ten games without a win. <laughs> so it's it's um you can you can never tell, but I think the guys are they're in a good place. I think everyone realizes what has to be done, um, and what we can't fall back into. Uh, we we finished the season strong last year. We were so far out of making the playoffs after we played in the league's cup. Um, and then we went on a incredible run of games after that. Pretty much won the majority of them. Snuck into the playoffs in the last last day, and then we knock out you know, the the number one team. And then obviously fell short in the semi final against Houston. But I think <clears throat> we showed a lot of qualities that people would expect from this team. Um, it took us too long to get started, but I think towards the end of the season, people could see that. And, you know, when we're a team playing like that, especially when teams come to us, you know, we are we are not an easy team to play. Uh, teams know that. I know players know that because I've spoke to plenty of them um, and they hate coming to us, you know, when we are when we are like that. So it's it's up to us. We have to do that continuously throughout the season. Um, and we can't let our standards drop. That's obviously on me a lot as well to drive that. Um, so I'm excited. Um, it's another year to try and go and win a trophy. Um, another year to go out and compete and play the game you love. Johnny, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. Pleasure.